Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How Can Child Welfare and Youth Serving Organisations Keep Children Safe? My name is Ellie Robinson, and I'm the Executive Manager of Practice, Evidence and Engagement here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders from the other communities who may be present today. We will hear about evidence-based solutions to creating child safe cultures in child and family welfare organisations in today's webinar. Before I introduce our presenter, I would also like to alert you to some brief housekeeping details. You are able to submit questions via the chat box at any time during the webinar. We have some time at the end of the presentation to respond to as many questions as possible. And we've also set up a forum on the CFCA Information Exchange website where you can discuss the ideas and issues raised and submit additional questions for our presenter. We will send you a link to the forum at the conclusion of today's presentation. Please remember that this webinar is being recorded and the audio, transcript and presentation slides will be made available on our website and YouTube channel in due course. Accessible versions will also be available. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Associate Professor Darrell Higgins is the Deputy Director of Research at the Australian Institute of Family Studies, where he has responsibility for the Institute's research program and its knowledge translation and exchange functions. Darrell also holds an adjunct academic appointment at the University of Melbourne. Darrell is a registered psychologist and has been researching child abuse, family violence, sexuality and family functioning since 1993. He has extensive experience in managing and supervising research and has led projects looking at child abuse and neglect, children in out-of-home care, and child-safe organisations, to name a few. As well as collaborating with international colleagues on a project for the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, examining risk factors for particular types of organisations, Darrell has recently published a paper in the journal Developing Practice that explains the national and international context and an overview of what we have learned from research about creating safety for children. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you, Ali, and it's a great pleasure to be here within my own organisation presenting this uh, this webinar. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge um, my uh, respect for elders, past and present. Um, in terms of acknowledgements, I'd also mention uh, two colleagues, Keith Kaufman and Marcus Aruga, who um, have worked with me on some of the um, analysis of research relating to particular um, risk factors in different types of organisations, and to a number of colleagues past and present at the Institute, including those who've worked as part of the CFCA Information Exchange. Today, I want this to be evidence-based. I want to reflect on research but it's also about reflecting on the implications of theoretical constructs relating to risk and how that actually applies to the everyday realities that I know you as attendees at today's webinar are likely to be encountering. So I want this to be practical. And in order to achieve that, I'd like you to just spend a few seconds thinking about the organisation that you work in or if you're actually not personally involved in um, a child-focused organisation, think about a, um, an organisation that your son or daughter or another family member or a friend might be involved with. And think about what that organisation does. What do you think might be the most risky aspect of that organisation's activity that could possibly allow the sexual abuse of a child? So just take a moment to write down what you think that particular activity or the or the element of that activity that might bring about the greatest risk and i want you to come back to that after i've talked a little bit about some of the frameworks that we think about in terms of assessing risk and addressing risk and let's see whether um, by the end of today's webinar i've given you some suggestions for how you might be able to think through and address to to mitigate or reduce that particular risk. So that's a, a bit of a tall order I've set for myself, um, but I'd love to hear your feedback at the end as to whether you think that today's been helpful in trying to address that. So on the screen now, you can probably see a very large number of risk factors that has been identified in research over the years around characteristics of children that might increase their vulnerability to sexual abuse, 
or characteristics of offenders or adults would be offenders that might increase the chance of them being an offender or engaging in offending behaviour. Now, I'm not going to focus too much on this today because that research is relatively well known. It probably is not going to come as a surprise to you. What I think is a bit of a surprise is the third aspect that we have much less visibility of and much less focus on in terms of our prevention strategies and the responsibilities of organisations right throughout the community. And I'm talking here about um, volunteer organisations, not just um, funded services like out-of-home care residential um, care providers. So what are the characteristics of the environment within organisations and more broadly across the community that might increase risk. That's really what I want to focus on today. Why is that important? Well, if we think back about how within Australia we're trying to address the issue of prevention of child abuse, uh, we have a national framework for protecting Australia's children, which explicitly is based on what we call a public health approach to prevention. And what that identifies, first of all, is that we try and address harm before it occurs by looking at what the uh, drivers are of uh, a particular event, in this instance, child abuse and neglect. And therefore, we have to look at the risk factors. So where those characteristics might be occurring and how those can be changed in order to reduce the likelihood of an event such as child maltreatment occurring rather than focusing on detection of events after they've occurred and ameliorating their impacts. And of course, that's what statutory child protection systems are focused on. So explicitly, the national framework is about trying to move things upstream to a public health approach. So therefore, we need to look at what are those risk factors at the individual level, at the parent or the family level, um, at the level of those who are offenders or would be perpetrators, particularly within the context of them having already been identified um, as an offender, how do we reduce the likelihood of them re-offending? But importantly, what are some of the social or emotional uh, environmental factors, um, such as at the community level, our knowledge, our attitudes and our skills around um, prevention of abuse and child safety? And then specifically within the context of organisations, how do we identify and reduce situational risks and actually create child safe cultures right across our suite of child related and youth serving organisations? And that's going to be my focus today. I know this is a long preamble, um, but it's really important to kind of set up the rationale for why we are not focusing on individuals, um, but rather talking about systemic strategies that can be implemented across organisations and across communities. And the reality is that if we focus too much on the issue of trying to identify bad people, that we are likely to miss a whole lot of um, instances of sexual abuse. Why is that? Well, first time abusers have no offence history, so we're not going to detect them in any kind of screening system because they haven't yet offended. Also, much abuse goes undetected or unreported. So even if someone has abused before, if it hasn't been reported, or in fact, if we have poor systems to share information, that's not likely to be um, picked up and, uh, and, and identified. We also know that it's not just adults who engage in inappropriate or illegal or harmful behaviours. Um, we have good research to show that young people also engage in sexually abusive or harmful behaviours towards other young people, either younger than themselves or even same age peers. And so if we try and have too much of a focus on preventing bad adults, we will miss a lot of the um, potentially risky situations that young people are likely to be exposed to. The other thing that we can focus on is the lessons that we have learned from other elements of organisational safety. Um, there's things that we can learn from uh, the laws and the strategies that have been put in place to address um, occupational health and safety within um, organisations. We can also think about how we've tried to um, prevent issues of financial mismanagement within organisations. So just focusing on the latter, we don't expect that the processes for ensuring financial 
um, prudence rely primarily on employment screening, i.e. that you would be able to know that someone is a bad person and therefore shouldn't get into an organisation because they're likely to financially mismanagement, engage in fraud uh, or some other um, unfortunate activity, nor do we rely primarily on customer vigilance, that it's up to a, let's say, a uh, someone who deposits money in a bank to make sure that nothing goes on um, in that bank, that they are the ones who are responsible for their own safety. We don't have either of those things. Instead, what we have is systems right across organisations from financial institutions right through to small not-for-profit community organisations where we define what acceptable and unacceptable behaviour is, where we implement strategies to minimise some of those risks. So it could be as simple as having someone observe while somebody else counts cash when you've been collecting money through a volunteer or organisation. And thirdly, we make sure that we try and change the culture of organisations. And for those of you who are fans of um, movies and have seen The Wolf of Wall Street, we see there a very clear example of how within a broad sector, there was a culture of getting away with um, fraud and unscrupulous behaviour that actually led to widespread financial um, mismanagement. Similarly, and some of you will be thinking, oh, I've spent a lot of time going to the movies lately. Um, there's a couple of, of other examples that we've seen in, in the box office lately that remind us not to focus just on the individuals, but rather the power of the situation that sits behind those individual actions. Um, for example, the movie Spotlight really highlights the issue of um, how the Boston uh, um, diocese was exposed for their cover-up uh, within the church of um, abuse and how there was failures to disclose. But really what the, um, the movie emphasises was not the individual behaviour of one or two people, but rather the systems that failed to um, support when those concerns were raised. So it moves it on from the level of a bad person to a bad system. And that same theme emerges in um, the Stanford Prison experiment. And that has, uh, you know, it's a famous psychology experiment. Those of you who've, who've done um, psychology or, or, or even social work where you're exposed to some of these um, key uh, research studies from the, from the 1970s will know the, um, the amazing ways in which uh, the situation determines and strongly influences individuals' behaviour. And so there was a small group of undergraduate college students who were selected for a, an experiment randomly assigned to two groups. They were either chosen to be um, prison guards or prisoners. There were no differences between those two groups. It was randomly assigned. And yet what happened within a very short space of time, a matter of hours, that they started to comply with the expected behaviours. Um, and I think I've said enough about that, but the, the important issue is it's not about bad people. It's about saying how can we at a systems level change the situation so that anybody is likely to be um, prevented from engaging in untoward behaviour. So it demonstrates the power of the situation and the implication, I think, for child safety in organisations is that we've failed and we will continue to fail if we try and focus solely on identifying, weeding out or preventing bad people from joining organisations. So what are some of the key risks in child-related organisations that we need to think about that simply focusing on screening and detection um, is not going to pick up? Well, for those of you who've worked in the area of child abuse and neglect and particularly child sexual abuse, you will have heard of the concept of grooming. And this is the um, process prior to the act of abuse. It's a precursor that those who are going to engage in offending behaviour will rely on to build up a relationship and to build up trust between them and the victim, but also the institutional community. And that's what I would really like to focus on now is that grooming doesn't just occur with victims. Grooming actually occurs with others within the organisation because we know from research about offenders is that they are often seen as being high profile, trustworthy, um, important people within organisations and within communities. And the claim will often be, oh, it couldn't possibly be him or it couldn't possibly be her. Uh, 
So the modus operandi of perpetrators might differ between institutional contexts um, and different settings allow different opportunities for and different facilitators of abuse. So we actually need to take a, a different lens depending on the type of organisation that we're working in and what are the particular opportunities that our organisation provides. And I hope you're starting to think back to those notes that you wrote back at the beginning about what is the risky elements of your particular organisation. And just as an example, we know that this is not static, but changes over time. So when we have new technologies available, mobile phones that have, you know, smartphone um, capability and new socio social media um, uh, apps and so forth open up new avenues for communication and therefore for engagement in those grooming behaviours that are one of those necessary precursors in most instances for sexual abuse to occur. So therefore, we can see how elements of the climate of, of an organisation, the particular culture and the norms that go on within organisations can actually act to facilitate or hopefully to interrupt abuse and its precursors. And so I've got a quote here from a researcher saying, just as children are groomed by adults to allow them to perpetrate sexual acts, other adults are groomed or desensitised to perceive potentially risky behaviour as harmless. So now I'm getting to the bulk of the um, task of today's webinar, and that's to talk about what do child safe environments look like and what are the important steps. As you've probably guessed, I've already talked about the limitations of screening for known perpetrators, but that's not to in any way diminish the importance of it as a first step. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about managing situational risks and what we've learned from research about risk factors and strategies for prevention. But most importantly, I want to end on talking about creating positive cultures and how we need to focus on clarifying unacceptable behaviours, encouraging disclosures and involving authorities. So let's talk firstly about screening. So that is that first but very minimal step of preventing those who we already know um, carry risks. And so the three steps there are undertaking police checks, working with children checks and following mandatory reporting um, and disclosure laws. So in pre-employment screening, I'm going to go through fairly quickly, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, there's some great resources on the CFCA website around what police checks are, what a working with children check is, which is more extensive, but also more targeted. So it doesn't just include offences, but it includes a, a wider range of concerning behaviours, but it's also not as extensive as police checks in that police checks will go to uh, other elements of um, uh, criminal behaviour that are not relevant for a working with children check. So you have to think about fit for purpose and what the obligations are within your particular organisation or sector. So you need to understand those obligations um, very clearly, but most importantly, to recognise the limitations of pre-employment screening. That, as I said earlier, most child sex offenders do not have criminal records. So therefore, having staff vetted through a pre-employment screening of some sort is just the first chapter in the book, not the final chapter. Therefore, we need to go on to some of the next steps about creating child-safe organisations through policies, through monitoring and through ongoing actions. Mandatory reporting is also an important step because, as I said, while most um, abusers won't necessarily have been reported, one of the ways of turning that around is to follow the guidelines around mandatory reporting. That way there's an increased chance that those who have engaged in offending behaviour are then known to authorities and therefore can be detected in the future. So it's not about preventing harm now because the harm is likely to have already occurred. It's about preventing harm for future and building up a, a database, if you like, of those who have a known history, even though, of course, that has serious limitations. And as you can see here on the, um, on the slide, there's also quite a bit of variability between the laws right across Australia regarding who is mandated to report and what it is that they're mandated to report about. So the types of situations and the types of harm. And finally, I'd point out that Victoria now has some new legislation that's about failure to disclose, which is covering all adults with a reasonable belief that a sexual offence has been committed against a child. And that's quite separate from the mandatory reporting obligations that apply to um, specified professional groups. So it's important that people are keeping up to date with that information and please 
please keep checking with CFCA for updates regarding those kind of laws. Secondly, is the issue of managing situational risks. So making organised safer, organisation safer involves identifying those risk factors, changing risky environments where possible, and where it's not possible because of the um, activity inherently has some risks, it's about closer monitoring in order to be able to try and minimise those. So different organisations will have a different risk profile and I'm sure for all of you who are listening in today and have written down what's the most risky element of the organisation that you're involved in or are aware of, I'm sure that we will have different things written down for many of you. There'll be some overlaps but there'll be some really different things. And why is that? Well, because organisations operate in different ways. And we know, for example, that organisations that are more like a family style environment are some of the ones that ironically carry the higher risk. Why is that? You would think that uh, families are a place of safety and security for children. And of course, for many children, they are. But families themselves are one of the opportunities of risk. And that is because families have those characteristics of high levels of trust, high levels of interaction unsupervised by others. And so where those same characteristics are occurring in organisations, they tend to carry higher risk. So that's where staff might be required to act in the place of parents and to be ex um, exercising parental responsibility. Um, where there's a need for physical contact with children or young people, for example, through showering, through toileting, through changing clothes, such as some um, sports organisations, where there are sleepovers or camps and where there's a need for transport at odd hours or where there's unexpected decisions that need to be made that involve um, interaction with and supervision of children. So some of the questions that you might want to ask yourself if you struggle to write down at the beginning an example of what is a risky element of your particular organisation is to think about, do you have low levels of supervision from others of adult-child interactions? So who gets to see when an adult is spending time one-on-one -on -one with a child or a young person? Are adults used as role models or as mentors? Are they meant to be friendly and building trust with young people? Are there opportunities for um, private communication channels where there's low levels of supervision, such as social media? And are there other elements to the organisation's culture that actually might allow abuse to be tolerated or excused? So is there a strong gender stereotype? Are there only males or only females involved either as children and young people or as the adults or the supervisors within the organisation? Um, are there unfortunate adult uh, attitudes regarding um, same-sex attracted young people that might lead to actual or perceptions of homophobia and therefore young people feel as though they are silenced and uh, somehow excluded or marginalised and increase their vulnerability? Is there alcohol um, misused within the organisation that could be used as an excuse or as a facilitator for perpetrators or something that um, is used to overcome the, uh, the inhibitions, if you like, of a, of a child or a young person? So these are all questions that um, we know that research has pointed out are examples of things that carry greater risk, but the operationalisation of them in your particular organisation is something that you have to work through and find out where those elements of risk might be operating, why they're operating, how inherent they are, and what might be um, the opportunities for changing or ameliorating some of those risks. But in talking about risk, I don't want to sound alarmist because, of course, many of those things that I just talked about, not only are they things that carry risk, but they are also things that carry opportunities. Um, we know that building trust and um, having close mentoring relationships between adults and children can be really positive and can be an essential component of some programs. For example, if you're running a mentoring program, it's not sufficient just to say, well, it involves mentoring, therefore it carries risk, therefore we won't do it. It's about how do you put in place strategies to try and mitigate that risk and to do a better job of supporting 
both adults and young people within that organisation so that those activities that do inherently carry a higher level of risk can still occur because they are important and we have evidence to show that they're important for building resilience and supporting young people. Um, and so some possible protective factors we know is that adults can be positive role models and can actually model safe um, relationships, model demonstrating the way in which they put in place boundaries around their personal life, around their personal physical space, etc. Um, encouraging and responding appropriately to abuse that's occurring elsewhere is one way that adults within an organisation can demonstrate that they are supporting and using those um, opportunities of having close and trusting relationships with uh, children and young people for their good. And of course, fostering inclusion and peer support right across the organisation. So I don't want you to be left thinking that um, organisations are all about risk and you should, should go looking for risks everywhere without also looking at what are the opportunities and that you don't inadvertently lead to a reduction in the effectiveness of your organisation's activities and its supports for children and young people. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the um, research that we have on what's called situational crime prevention. And this has come from the fields of criminology and uh, juvenile justice and, uh, and other fields like that, where we understand uh, that given the right circumstances, anyone could offend. So, for example, uh, safety from car theft. We don't focus on trying to identify who are the high-risk car thieves. We've actually put most of our effort into changing the situation such as having better car locks, having visible um, uh, systems of alarms, or we, I remember from the 80s and 90s before the sort of electronic locks, there were the, um, the big manual locks that you would put over your uh, steering wheel. So it was very visible that the car was locked and therefore trying to break in and steal it wouldn't be um, effective. Um, removing money and handbags and wallets and, um, and cash from um, visible places within the car or any other things, of course, is another of those strategies. So how can we think about what we've learned from some of these other aspects and try and approach it, uh, apply them to the issue of um, crime against children and particularly sexual crime? So the basic tenets of a situational crime prevention approach is that it's meant to focus on trying to address the limits of um, pre-employment screening and ongoing suitability assessments because it focuses on creating safe environments rather than safe individuals. So what are the ways we do that? First of all, it's primarily about reducing opportunity. And by that, what we mean is making crime more risky. And let's not forget, when we're talking about child sexual abuse, we're not just talking about untoward behaviours. We're, we're at a point in our society where we absolutely know that this is criminal behaviour. So let's think about what we can learn from other elements of criminal behaviour. So it's about making crime more risky, making crime more effortful, reducing the rewards for engaging in that crime, removing the excuses and preventing and for people around that young person or that potential offender um, to not tolerate what we call grooming behaviour. How do we do that? And this is really the final and most important part of my presentation today, is to talk about some of the critical steps in creating child safe organisations. And by that, we really mean the positive organisational culture that um, gets rid of excuses and makes overt the importance of protecting children and addressing at all levels within the organisation um, risks that might occur. So the three kind of key aspects is clarifying unacceptable behaviour, encouraging and responding appropriately to disclosures, and thirdly, um, involving police and child protection authorities. But it's really the first one that I think is the most important one of those. So what are some examples of what we mean by that? So one is values-based interviewing. What we mean by that is not simply screening in terms of um, have you ever had a, an offence uh, that relates to a child, but rather talking about the conditions that might facilitate or inhibit 
those untoward behaviours starting to occur, let alone a criminal behaviour actually occurring. And so being able to, at, a, at an interview or a selection process for a, you know, for a volunteer or for commencement of a, of a program, that you talk about um, those things that are important to a child safe organisation. So the value of children, um, talking about how people would apply um, their thinking to a particular context. Um, creating induction programs, once you've gone through that screening and the values-based interviewing and made sure that you're happy with the, the way in which a person coming into an organisation as a worker or as a volunteer is going to be approaching children and valuing children, it's about reinforcing that through induction programs where you define what acceptable behaviour is. Now, recently, I, I came across a, um, a, a statement by an organisation, Life Without Barriers, and there are a number of organisations like this, where they make very clear what acceptable behaviour is. And they have one example for people working in residential care settings, where they say explicitly, um, people, workers who are staying overnight need to make sure that they are wearing pyjamas. Now, that seems like a, a kind of a, a bit of an odd thing to say in some ways, and yet it's a very practical thing. You have to think about what are the steps that you need to go through. If you're a worker, you need to be able to be prepared to be interrupted during the middle of the night um, and therefore having appropriate attire on in order to not place yourself at risk, let alone place a young person or other person at risk, um, is really important. So it's about thinking through what are the particular requirements of my organisational setting um, for both adults and for children and young people. Those induction programs then need to be reinforced with ongoing professional development. So I hope you're starting to get a, um, a very strong message here that this is not about a, a single action that can be taken, but it's a rather, rather a suite of interconnected activities that need to be continually revised and reinforced right throughout the life of a project, a program or an organisation. So professional development, implementing supervision, mentoring and accountability for staff. Now, I would ask you, those of you who are supervisors or team leaders, how often do you ask your team members um, who are working with children or young people um, specific questions about have they ever observed something that was a concerning behaviour? either by another staff member um, or were they ever asked to do something that was inappropriate. And unless we ask these direct questions, we're not likely to get answers. And certainly in other areas, we have the same things. I'm, I'm, I'm on a, a risk committee for a Commonwealth organisation where the auditors literally ask other members of the committee to say, are you aware of any other information that would be of concern? And unless you ask those kind of questions, you're not likely to get the, the answers because people often feel as though, well, uh, you know, I don't really know, I'm not quite sure, I might be, you know, dobbing in somebody. So we have to turn that around and talk about um, things more often so that we have an open environment and can discuss concerns freely. Um, we also have to have good supports and training around understanding and compliance with mandatory reporting obligations. As I said before, there needs to be a, um, a process, a structured process to support the analysis and then the addressing of risks right across each organisation. It's not possible to develop one template and say this can be applied right across every organisation because of the different types of activities that agencies and organisations and different community sectors um, engage in. So there does need to be tailoring of those kind of um, analysis of risks and therefore the kind of policies, procedures and standards that need to be developed in order to address those risks. And of course, for them to be not just done once and placed upon that shelf for dust to collect on them, but rather to be regularly used and reviewed and updated as part of the um, business as usual of uh, an organisation. Secondly, and this is um, equally important in terms of sending a strong message around the culture of an organisation is the importance of facilitating disclosure of actual abuse or disclosure of concerning behaviour. So where a young person um, has been asked to do something or feels icky or feels unsure, 
So it's the process about telling somebody about an incident of sexual assault or one of its precursors. So we need to be able to reinforce that in contexts such as um, abuse between peers in schools or youth serving organisations, um, between peers outside of those organisations, at home um, or elsewhere, as well as those that actually occur within the organisation by adults. So it's important that all of those issues are part of disclosure policies. Um, and it can relate not just to sexual abuse, but as I indicated before, if we have a culture where other forms of bullying, um, harassment, discrimination, and other forms of child abuse, such as physical abuse or emotional abuse are going on, we know from past research that those things often go hand in hand with a higher risk of sexual abuse and it goes to a culture of saying, I won't be believed, I won't be trusted, I won't be valued as a child or a young person. So we need to take an integrated approach to addressing those risks to young people in order for them to feel as though they can speak up when they have a concern. From the research that um, we've, uh, we've done, we know that disclosure isn't always a conscious or a planned decision, um, that young people and adults who've experienced sexual assault as well um, will often talk about um, the need for safety, protection and support, for not wanting to be alone and for seeking information to help them clarify their understandings about the nature of assault. And so therefore it can happen at different times and in different places. And we also know that it can take multiple attempts that many, many people um, will say that they have uh, taken three or four or five times to actually disclose. And that's certainly backed up by the evidence that the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse has been um, disseminating, that we know that this is a process and therefore one of the strategies that we can do to make our organisation safer for children is to take seriously those first disclosures um, and treat them as important um, revelations from a child or a young person. Overcoming some of those barriers, and I think I've talked about most of these, um, so I won't go into those uh, in detail, but make sure that we think about what those barriers might be in our particular organisation, or more importantly, how can we put in place policies or procedures that try and address this? And that could be in terms of professional development to try and overcome some of those uh, cultural things, um, such as the expectations about um, what's normal for young men and women in heterosexual relations relationships or um, clash of expectations regarding masculinity or sexuality. I'd also like to um, talk for a moment a little bit about the importance of a whole of organisation approach. And why that's important is it's not enough for one particular segment of an organisation, such as one class within a school um, or one uh, group within an organisation to be trying to be a leading light and just assuming that that will be enough because that can easily, the good work within one area can very easily be undone um, by another area. And that could actually be um, even riskier for a young person to think that they will be supported and then to find that they are not once they encounter someone from elsewhere within the organisation who isn't on board. So for them to, to work, and there's a lot of research around different forms of harm to children, not just about um, sexual abuse, but um, about homophobia, about bullying, and about other elements of respectful relationships that all lead to this same message about the importance of whole of organisation approaches. Um, and so we need to be able to link together strategies around promoting respectful relationships, around physical physically safe environments and around emotionally safe environments. So some of the concrete activities that you can do there is about having agreed definitions across the whole of the organisation about what, what is meant by child sexual abuse. Statements about what are the consequences for offending. I mean, that's one of the clearest things that can get written into a policy. What will happen if an adult or a, a, another young person, for that matter, is, in, is, is found to have been involved in engaging in sexually coercive or abusive behaviour? Um, clear and published policies and procedures that are victim-centred and that are supported with regular training, review, monitoring and evaluation. We also need to think about prevention education programs for students and young people, for teachers 
and also their family members. Again, getting to that point that we actually need to have all people who are involved in those young people's lives um, being educated and made more aware of what the risk factors are and how they can be um, addressed right throughout um, all elements of, of a community. Um, and some examples of that uh, can be seen in the documentation around the National Safe Schools Framework, which obviously is focused primarily around things like emotional well-being and prevention of bullying, but it applies equally well to the issue of child sexual abuse prevention in terms of the, the broad strategies and the way in which they needed to be embedded in a whole of organisation approach. So I won't go into any detail on that because I know we're getting towards the end of our time for this webinar, but you can see on the, um, the slide there, the URL to the National Safe Schools Framework and some of the anti-bullying strategies that you can see have a, a, a large amount of overlap with what's needed in order to be able to raise awareness around child sexual abuse, the precursors to it, what um, allows grooming to go on and how we can try and interrupt that. We also need to, when thinking about um, a particular type of organisation, think about how some of the context around that might um, add additional complexity to understanding or in fact overcoming what some of those risks are. And I was involved in some research a number of years ago that was looking at a case study of a particular religious organisation um, where there was an allegation of abuse that was raised um, about a, 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 a young person, an, an, an adult, a, a young adult against a, uh, a young female within the congregation. And the analysis of that case study and linking it with the available literature identified a number of problematic organisational features that in many ways can be inherently linked to the business of the organisation. So within this particular religious community, there was unquestioned power and high levels of authority placed in leaders. There was minimisation and denial of allegations by leaders in positions of authority. There was failure to encourage victims to report to police. There was inappropriate responses to legal proceedings that had been commenced. Um, and then there was the doctrinal or theological beliefs and practices that supported patriarchal views and repressed sexuality. And of course, um, in, in many different types of religious institutions, we have questions around the role that celibacy might play in particular. And I know that those things have come up in relation to evidence given before the Royal Commission. We saw in this particular case study failure to appropriately support both victims and alleged offenders and making sure that that's done separately but carefully. Um, we saw poor leadership and polarisation of members of the church or religious community. And of course, underlying that, some um, particular beliefs around sex roles. And so here you can see a quote from that research saying religious sex role beliefs that posit men's sexuality as unable to be contained and women as the source of men's incitement and church doctrines and practices that support patriarchy are some of those things that contribute to an organisational culture in which disclosure of sexual abuse is discouraged and victims are unsupported. So that's just one example of how you might be able to think through a particular context of, a, of an organisation and how the activities, such as preaching sermons um, uh, with particular belief sets, might be contributing or have the opportunity to support um, young people who are at risk. So to sum up what I've been talking about today, the focus of prevention of child abuse and neglect spans the continuum from awareness training to a range of organisations through to more systemic institution-wide efforts to identify and ameliorate environmental or situational risks that create conditions that allow child sexual abuse to occur. And so what we need to do is ensure that existing, existing protective systems and processes are implemented more rigorously, more thoroughly, and more consistently. And you can see on the screen there, and I won't leave this up for too long because you'll be able to access these slides later, there are a number of resources that you can draw on for thinking through and accessing um, uh, templates and, and ideas for how to create uh, child safe organisational policies and procedures and climates within your organisation.
But it also goes beyond organisation and goes to community. And I'm aware of some resources and some campaigns that have happened around understanding how the sexualized imagery that many um, young people are exposed to um, is one of those contributing factors. Um, and so we need good relationship education and sexuality education in order to be one part of that picture. And so you can see the um, URL addresses here for these resources. So to summarise the risk management strategies, it's about pre-employment screening, including values-based interviewing and ongoing suitability assessment. Secondly, it's about minimising situational risks by limiting those opportunities and recognising that any person can perpetrate child abuse, even though some people might be at higher risk, particularly those who have already engaged in that behaviour. Most importantly, that there's a need for appropriate, articulated and supported policies and procedures about identifying signs of abuse, about responding to disclosures, about tr training and providing ongoing support for staff and other adults. And all of that is about leading to more positive culture that is child-friendly, transparent and respectful. I also think that there's an important role for implementing specific prevention programs and strategies. Often people will talk about these as um, uh, protective behaviours programs, um, but I think that they have serious limitations unless we embed them in a whole of organisation child safety strategy, because otherwise we risk um, sending the message that it's the role of young people to protect themselves, whereas it's actually the role of adults and organisations to be child safe, to be child friendly. Um, and of course, empowering children and young people with information is one component, but it's by no mean the first and foremost of those. Finally, I'd like to remind people that what I've been talking about today is entirely consistent with research um, uh, synthesis that's come out from the Royal Commission on what they see as the key elements of a child safe institution. And I won't read out all of those, but I've just listed the 10 different elements that um, has been coming out from the research that they have uh, commissioned at the Royal Commission. Um, and you can see at the bottom of the slide the URL so you can access um, that information. And of course, all of the uh, resources that we've been talking about today can be accessed from the uh, Child Family Community Australia Information Exchange. So um, please continue to engage with that resource in order to um, access information. Um, I've talked for a little bit about um, the specific example of religious organisations and I know that a lot of great work has been happening through organisations such as the National Council of Churches in Australia which has a framework and standards and a safe church training agreement and many of the denominations have um, uh, developed for themselves um, particular policies around responding to and protecting children. So we know that there's a lot of good work going on in a range of different organisations and I would um, commend those resources to you. And finally, you can see a list of uh, references from some of the research that I've been drawing on for this presentation. So that's the end of my presentation and I'd like to turn over to questions now from you all. And I know Ali's going to um, try and mediate some of that for me. Thanks, Ellie.